class from last, not last semester, I guess it was, it wasn't the book of Revelation. It was on the restoration. So it was last, not Revelation, but the one before that. Yeah, so I'm yeah. doing those for Book of Mormon Central. And I, I have already done two on the second coming and I'm recording one of them um, on Friday. I don't remember which section I'm going to do it. I've already done 29 and 45. So this must be like 53 or something. I don't know. But um, I pull that out and I just say that as much as I can because I just feel like we need to realize we have the responsibility for taking care of that baby. We got to get our hair curled correctly for that bridegroom to re bride to be ready. And it has nothing to do with curlers, you know. <laughs> Hi, Glenna. Hi, Look at this. Hi, Marcy. This is great. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Melissa. Well, the hour is one minute away and I totally, totally forgot an opening hymn. Marcy, have you got your fiddle ready? Can you play something for us? I do have my fiddle, but I have to turn the machine on for my mom upstairs. So it'll take 30 seconds to get back. So I don't know if you want to wait for that. Oh, we'll do it after the prayer. That'll be fine. Yeah, you can okay. go get your mom. Right. Go right okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Since she's teaching violin, I figure she's always ready. You know, when you're teaching every day, you got your your calluses on, you got a hymn in your pocket. And I know that some people who are musicians do not like to perform extemporaneously, but Marshley, I think is one of those like my son Abe who does um, but welcome welcome glad you're here for another week of comparing and this was so fascinating to me to compare the nature of God and the nature of man and um, Marla has done such a great job getting some more of you tied into a little bit extra research so if you're interested at all in doing any research on any topic even if it's just you know for your own interests, let her know. And I'll just um, give you two or three minutes of class time or four or five, or if it's gonna be as much as some people have done, uh, I'm gonna give you a lot of time. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of the classes on the priesthood that we'll do in a couple of weeks. Those, we're gonna have a lot, of, a lot of extra research has been done. And I'm hoping that Court and Nancy and um, Laura will be willing to share their, their hours and hours on that one. That was really fascinating, but please um, join in if you're interested in doing any active learning instead of just passive learning on this one. I'd love to have you add your um, insights and, and your sensitivity to, actually, I'd like to hear your thoughts on anything, whether or not you've done any research, but if you do want to do research, please contact Marla. She'll put you on the Google doc and we'll give you the date and move ahead from there. But our wonderful Emily um, is going to um, take care of the prayers for us. So Emily, do you want to tell me who you've got in mind? I don't know. So, so Glenna, has, Glenna Heaton has agreed to say the opening prayer. Hi, Glenna. And, and Kate Foster will give us the closing prayer. So if you just want to. Blessing that. on you, Emily. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd love to hear your feedback on this. I think then I just started, I just started the recording. Would you mind just starting again? Because oh, yeah. I didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. That sentence. Hello, nice to see you here. Welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. The nature of God and the nature of man is absolutely fascinating, not because we have different scriptures, but because we interpret those scriptures differently. And I am just blown away that really we, we don't have that many different scriptures. Let me share my screen with you and show you some of them. Um, as soon as I'm allowed to, and then we'll try again. Um, right. Because the, the nature of God seems to be far more similar than the nature of man. And that's what makes such a huge difference. So as you take a, a peek there, um, in, in addition to the numbers that we'll see, um, let me know what you think about the, those differences. Because I feel like in order to appreciate what we have in the restoration scriptures, it really helps to see 
what we would do without them. And in this case, I really feel like the Bible has plenty of fabulous sources, um, but there are a lot more than just in the Book of Mormon. In fact, I, I almost feel like the Pearl of Great Price, I don't know how many of you have seen the handout, but I spelled it Pearly of Great Price with a little Y at the end, which was totally accidental, I apologize, <laughs> has, has the real doctrinal changes. Um, of both the Lord and of humanity, but the um, Book of Mormon has humanity too. They all do. Oops, let's keep going. Not, not that one again. Interestingly, as we look at the Bible though, there is continuity um, in both the nature of God and the nature of man between all three. And that shouldn't surprise us, but the reason why it's surprising is because other people who have the um, biblical text see it so differently that it, it that surprises me. So I'm just going to go through a whole litany, and I didn't write out as many that are on the handout, and the handout aren't does not include as many as are in the topical index. But I just tried to get you a good overview, so just so you would be immersed. So I'm just going to spend, um, you know, five minutes in the Old Testament, five minutes in the New Testament before we get into the different interpretations of those. So let's jump into Genesis. And God said, "Let us make man in our own image." after our likeness and let them have dominion. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Great, beautiful scripture mastery. Lynn, can I interrupt? Uh, oh, yes, your please, slides are not progressing. Uh, oh, they are for me? Okay, they're not for us. We, we, all we have is the uh, load screen. We don't even have the okay. full screen. Okay, sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. What does that mean? It means you have multiple windows open, most likely. Okay, I um, PowerPoint and is I not only. On. Okay, let me close up. That went Gabriel. I'm so glad you interrupted. Thank you for that observation. Okay, yeah, after um, not interrupting a few times uh, a few months ago, I'm I'm very keen on interrupting as soon as possible. <laughs> okay, I have no slides up anywhere. And on my screen, it says, I'm just going to stop sharing and just redo it. Okay, there we go. Slide share, desktop. Got to pull up my. Um, share. Can you see it now? Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. I, and I can progress and go back. Can you see these? Different uh, slides. It's filling the screen, but it's not in full screen mode. If that makes sense, the window is just really big. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. Um, let me just try to get that out of the road there. Huh. Well, we got that's it. perfect for me. Looks good. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so there's Michelangelo for you on Genesis 126. Genesis 3, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Um, Deuteronomy 4, 7, the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him. Um, Psalm 77, what God is as great as our God. Oh God, your ways are holy. Nahum. And there were many like this. The Lord is a zealous, and usually this is translated jealous, like in the King James. I'm using here, as you can see, the new English translation, because I didn't want jealous, but zealous is almost as bad. The Lord is a zealous and avenging God, and the Lord is avenging and very angry. The Lord takes vengeance against his foes. He sustains his rage against his enemies. God is the watchman over Ephraim. And now into the New Testament, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Show me the penny, whose image or superscription hath it? And they answered Caesar's. And he said unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are be Caesar's and unto God the things which be God's. And of course, I believe the countenance is what he's referring to since we are created in the image of God, according to Genesis 126. This was an interesting translation difference uh, between um, John. Usually it is translated in chapter four, God is spirit. But the Aramaic Bible that 
um, takes it from Greek to Aramaic to English, which is a little uh, circuitous, but it's interesting to see what comes out is for the spirit is God. I love Acts 10, God is no respecter of persons. First Corinthians one, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. God, this is John, first John one five, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. And you know, John in both his gospel and his epistles and in the book of revelation use this imagery of God as light so frequently. And I believe in the gospel of John, it's when Christ comes down to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, when they have those huge, 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 85 feet tall um, uh, menorahs that are lighting the whole court of the women and court of the priests in honor of, to represent the Shekinah that was the pillar of fire by day. Remember when Moses was in the wilderness, they had the cloud, no, 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 the cloud by day, the pillar by night. So these candelabras, these menorahs um, are representing, I, I think they're more like a football field light is the, what I think it must've looked like in that era, but um, they were representing that Shekinah, the, the pillar by night. And John is the one that refers to Christ um, sermon on that as he does here also in his first john also in first john is where we hear many many times god is love and i love the fact that they can use it as a verb and a noun and um those scriptures and many many more like that in that same genre i didn't find too many that were completely different than that spectrum of showing anger at times and showing love at times and hearing prayers at times and not hearing prayers at times. All of those were um, interpreted very differently in the, first, in the second century um, after Christ's death. And so in the third century when Constantine, or the fourth century when Constantine um, decided to have Christianity as the rule of law throughout the Roman Empire, they felt the need for consensus. And in order to communicate things between a very large, um, a very large group with lots of different religious ideas, there was um, at least 10 re religious ideas that were legal in the Roman Empire, one of which was Judaism, and, and at least 100 non-legal, illegal. <laughs> ones. And um, that's why it was difficult, I think, to come up with an official religion. But these doctrines had to be formalized. And they, this pressure on the uniformity really became difficult for the Greeks to agree to the Latins and to have each of the different countries that were, fell under the umbrella of the Roman Empire really led to some intense debates. And we began having these ecumenical councils to discuss specific ideologies. And one of the first was on, not surprisingly, the nature of God. And the Trinity became the compromise, the way to communicate it in many different cultures. And that is the gist of the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Council, um, that was finalized in 325. And I don't know if this helps you, but for me, I, I need things to help me remember my dates. So, so to remember the Nicaea Creed, I think of Alexander the Great is 325 BC, and then the Nicaea Creed is 325 AD. Um, but the, the problem was they still didn't know the relationship between well, they knew that, that the son came from the father, but did the spirit come from the father or the son? And so the role of the spirit was the discussion in later um, um, councils. And they had them in Constantinople in 385 and in um, many, many others that I have written up here. And the bottom line that came out for everyone to be pleased. Because remember in the Greek world, anything physical was a problem. If you had a um, the most pure life, it would just be spirit. And so 
the body is our condemnation, you know, because we sinned in heaven, according to the Greeks, and had pride or hubris, that's why we had to come to earth in a body. It was this miserable, constantly aching problem. If our mind could just move ahead, then we would find joy and happiness and peace, you know, but this body is the problem. And so they come up with this definition that God is actually just an essence. He is an entity, but but we will not trap him into a body. They didn't have the liberality to in, envision a perfected body or a body without pain. It was, say it again. They were anti-anthropomorphic. They were anti-anthropomorphic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mispronounced it. Um, but at the first Vatican Council, so you remember uh, when the Roman Empire splits in four, um, well, it starts with the Huns coming down in, in 400, but you get the East um, division and with the Greek speaking and their um, religious headquarters then becomes um, Istanbul, modern day Turkey, and the West becomes the universal church, which we now refer to the name Catholic, but it meant universal. And that then became the voice of um, what was believed. And this is a very, very long quote. I have way too many long quotes. So I think I'm just going to get picks, little pieces of it. And if you'd like to read all of it, they're in your handout as well as on, on here. But this... Um, faith clearly out of the new testament as well as um remember we first canonized and closed the canon in conjunction with these councils because there was too many heretics too many ideas that did not conform with the ideas of the council so you had to throw out all the scripture that did not conform with this ideology and so we only ended up with four gospels instead of the many, many others. And then once the Christian canon was closed, the Judaic um, fathers, uh, rabbis said, you know, we ought to do the same. And so they closed their canon, but there was an open canon up until these councils. Um, and the way they chose to define the nature of God was that he was one true living God, the creator, the Lord of heaven and earth. He was mighty, eternal, beyond measure, incomprehensible, infinite in intellect, in will and every perfection. You know, these are wonderful attributes. Since he is the unique spiritual, he is one unique spiritual substance, entirely simple and unchangeable. He must be declared really and essentially distinct from the world, perfectly happy in himself and by his very nature and inexpressible exalted over all things that exist and can be conceived other than himself. Now, I am not a philosopher and my first few days in grad school at Marquette University, which is a very wonderful Jesuit school, um, the professor said, those of you that did not have, um, that did not major in philosophy really are going to have a hard time in graduate school in theology. And I just sort of slunked under the table knowing that nursing didn't quite fit into philosophy. And I never was able to pass the test on having to describe the Trinity. I just, I, it's, it's a hard one. This is really tricky for me. The Protestants, of course, start um, reforming in a, a millennium later and some are very early, like Luther, and uh, others are, are much later. And it, over the 600-year period, we have different kinds of councils. And the Westminster Confession um, begins to formulate many of the beliefs that are still being practiced by the Protestants. And Marnie told me, Marnie, did you ever find your, your hymn books? Marnie told me that they even have them and are recited regularly in the different faith traditions that she attended. Uh, the only ones that I could come up with before class started uh, was a Methodist hymn book okay. uh, that, has, that has the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and uh, kind of a disclaimer for parts of the Athanasian creed. Yeah, yeah. We used to stand up, everybody would stand up after the 
after the opening hymn and the opening prayer, everybody would stand up and recite the, 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 the creed. creed. And it was, if you couldn't remember it from memory, it was in the back of the hymn book. You could read it. And Glenn? Yes, go right ahead. Th this is Glenn. Um, I was raised Catholic and we essentially did the same thing in the Catholic mass. And by the way, you knew it, you knew it verbatim by the time you were eight or nine years old. If you went to church, you had it down. Yeah, you had it down. Okay. So these are not just old fashioned things that people didn't believe in anymore. They are actively being incorporated into their, in their worship services. Totally. Okay. Okay. Well, you see, maybe if I had recited every day, I could have passed that test on the Trinity. That is not a good point on my greed card. <laughs> Here is from the Westminster Confession. So the majority of Americans at the time of Joseph Smith's father and um, at Joseph's birth and all the way through up until 1830 held this tradition um, the vast majority, not just close, but 80% by 1800 um, still held this tradition. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible without body parts, passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensive, almighty, most wise and most holy, most free and most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory. You wanna read this one? God hath all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself and is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he hath made nor deriving any glory from them. In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power and eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father and the Holy Ghost, eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. So I told you that there was a huge debate amongst the Greeks and the, uh, you know, the Western and Eastern thought at the t in the Roman Empire, trying to decide where did this spirit come from? And so when the Protestants made theirs, they say it comes from both. You know, it proceeds from both the Father and the Son. It's, it's all interesting to me since they believe they're one that they still need to have this origin but Lynn, they do. yes rich uh one thing might be worth saying here please uh, without body parts or passions yeah. pa as i understand it passions in this particular sense meant that uh that god could be acted upon that he could be influenced from uh, from the outside and said, he can't be, he's, uh, uh, he's um, not, he, nothing outside of him can, can affect him or change him. And that's the interpretation of that. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Anybody else have any thoughts or traditions about this that you'd like to share and enlighten us? I have one. Oh, please. I just remembered that when I was working for the Garnier family in France. Yes. Introduced me to, um, I was talking to their 10 year old who is now, I found out expecting her third baby, um, oh. just from this year, she's expecting her third. And she explained the Trinity to me. And so I just figure I'll bring it up because you know, um, yeah. like a pencil, but there's the, there's the eraser and there's the wood on the outside and there's the lead on the inside and that that's how, that's how Alban explained the Trinity to me. So. That's great. Yeah, it's it's helpful to understand where um, we each how we each define um, our God. Not that we need to emphasize the differences. That, um, but it's it's I think it's wonderful that we can learn to speak the language of other faith traditions and be sensitive to them their needs. And one way I tried to be sensitive is I had a picture of God up and Marnie encouraged me to change my picture of God for the Jewish, for the Torah. So we have the book of the law out for their Judaic thought here. All of these are very um, consistent with what we understand in the Torah in Genesis. The supreme being, God is a creator, the author, the first cause of the universe, the ruler of the world and men, 
the supreme judge and father, tempering justice with mercy, and works his purpose through his chosen agents. He communicates through prophets. I uh, thought that was great. And here is Islamic thought, also coming from the same traditions as our um, biblical, in addition to the Quran. Allah is the creator, judge, and rewarder. He's unique and inherently one. He is omnipotent and all merciful. Allah is the Lord of the worlds, plural. The most high, nothing is like him. And this in itself to the believer, a request door Allah as the protector and to glorify his powers. There is one infraction that God will not forgive. So we would refer to that as the unpardonable sin or the sin against the Holy Ghost or something. But they say there's one infraction that God will not forgive in the hereafter. And that is the sin of associationism and polytheism. And what that means, I think they're using very nice politically correct words here, but it means if you believe that there is a son of God or a God who came to earth to act as God on earth and to do God's work on earth, then that is associating. And if you believe there's a son of God who is on the right hand of God, that's polytheism and you will be left in outer darkness and have an unforgivable sin. So they really come down against our savior. And according to Moroni's definition, that part of it is an antichrist. So there is our quick overview of the biblical and other Christian ideology. But just think for a minute of what Joseph learned in his Pearl of Great, in the first vision about the nature of God and about his nature as a human being. And I feel that when Joseph said years and years later, you know, if you could just stare into heaven for 10 minutes, you'd learn more than all the books in heaven. You know, I always thought he was referring to the vision um, that he received in section 76, but maybe he was even referring to this first vision um, because all of a sudden the nature of God is different. Now I've read many reports of other wonderful Christians who have had visions of the Lord. And they also describe a glorified human-looking being who, who loves them and who's full of grace and beauty and light and dazzling, sparkling, um, fiery um, essence. So there's a difference between just seeing the vision and being able to understand it. And I have to remind myself all the time that Joseph doesn't come up with section 130. We believe in a God with bones and body um, until way late. You know, this is not coming out of the sacred grove. Out of the sacred grove, um, he's learning line upon line, but he, he understands more, I believe, about the nature of God than um, humanity had for a long time. He also writes the Articles of Faith in 1842, just two years before his death. And so this is very short, very soon, you know. But we believe in God, the eternal Father, and his son, Jesus Christ. I think the most dramatic difference in restored scripture on understanding the being of God is in the book of Genesis, Joseph Smith translation. We refer to it as Moses, the book of Moses, in our Pearl Great Price. But I... I don't know how I missed this in the past, but the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis is where we get all the doctrinal changes. The rest of the book has a few there and here, and we appreciate them, and we're always happy to see one. And if it's just a grammatical one, we are sort of disappointed. But Genesis is the powerhouse of change. The major Joseph Smith translation changes theologically are in the book of Genesis. And this, I feel, is the most dramatic of them all. Um, chapter one of Moses chapter one is the most dramatic of all. And verse 39, as we all could recite together, say it with me. This is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Um, we have this desire to increase God's glory 
in other faith traditions across Christianity and Islamic and Judaic thought. But that link that his work is for us instead of vice versa. I still am convinced that we are to work for him, that we are his servants. And I have just loved this year and come follow me counting out how many times my servant, Joseph, my servant, Sydney, my servant, um, Lyman, you know, repeated over and over again, just in case we would forget our relationship to him. But even in that servitude, we are apprenticing and it is what helps us become more and more like our beloved savior. This to me, section 19 is very consistent with what we read in the scriptures. I am Alpha and Omega, Christ the Lord, beginning and the end, redeemer of the world, until you get to verse 10. And then he starts talking about, I am endless. My name is endless. So if it's endless punishment, it doesn't mean it's going to be eternal. It means it is God's punishment. And he goes on for those verses talking about that. So, so there we start getting something different. And of course, in section 19 is the only place we have where we hear of the atonement in first person, where I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they may not suffer if they would repent. This is a huge theological change. When the majority of the nation is still believing that there's a set amount that are elect, and when the majority of Christianity still believes that you will be damned if you are not baptized. And even outside of Catholicism, just looking at Protestantism, it's an even smaller amount because, well, actually it's probably not smaller, but you have to have um, the, this, the, the Bible. You've had to have an experience with God in order to be saved. You have to have been born again. Um, and, and that's not what he says here. What he's teaching Martin Harris and Joseph, and me, <laughs> and I hope you, that he suffered for all so that we won't have to repent. And um, the most beautiful part about this for me is he did the crushing of Gethsemane so that we could just take the cup in the Last Supper. It's just incomprehensible the difference between the crushing pain that he endured and not that repentance is easier that, you know, but I just, that correlation that we've talked about in Institute before that was pointed out to me by a sweet young girl in Israel um, just really sings to my heart. And so our savior continues on, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit. And would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the father. And I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. I just think that's one of my most favorite texts in the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 63, without faith, no man please God, pleaseth God. And with whom God is angry, he is not well pleased. <laughs> yeah. So if we don't have our faith in gear, uh, and we're, the, the Lord would like us to, we're, we're in bad shape. Here's another one that is absolutely um, novel in its introduction of ideas on who God is. The glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Now take this in connection to section to um, Moses chapter one, verse 39. My work and my glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And the eternal life of man includes the intelligence. Now, I don't know if this word is being translated the same in both times. I believe it is because it's Joseph's vocabulary and he is the voice of the Lord in both of these situations, you know, the Lord is the one inspiring him with these two words. Um, but it is interesting to look at that. Um, my work and my glory is to bring to pass the immortality of my life and the glory of God is intelligence. 
um, and take it onto that new meaning that's introduced in Abraham chapter three and four. And I am not understanding why I can't move ahead. There we go. Um, I mentioned this earlier, section 130, verse 22. The, um, Joseph is giving short little clips here in a letter. The father has a body of flesh and bones. Now, this is not a spirit that is eating the honeycomb and fish, that is having his disciples touch and feel him. And in the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi 13, the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world. If it was mistaken, if it wasn't clear here, we'll get mixed up again in, um, <laughs> in King Benjamin's sermon. But here's another one uh, where during Nephi's vision of the Tree of Life, the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the wicked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and he is going to take down the devil. Um, this is in the last days. Um, also in 2 Nephi 22, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. This could as well be a psalm in the Old Testament. And since we hear so little of Jerem, even though God is a merciful God is nothing new, I just was so happy to find anything in the book of Jerem that I could share this, this decade in, in gospel doctrine. I mean, in, in Institute, uh, I was thrilled to find this one. God is exceedingly merciful. And I assume that this good prophet knew what that meant. And now we come to King Benjamin. And if you do not have a understanding of the first vision, this can become confusing. But if we do, it's beautiful and it helps us appreciate our savior all the more. Jesus Christ, the son of God, the father of heaven and earth. He is the father because he created it. And the father um, usually in, in mortal sense, our fathers either create us or they adopt us. And um, hence, Mosiah, King Benjamin's sermon introduces this beautiful level of love and respect for our Savior. Alma 26, we see that God is mindful of every people, whatsoever land they may be in. You know, this is a little bit like Peter. Do you remember when Peter has that dream where the sheet comes down and there's the unclean animals and then they're able to preach the gospel to the people, the Gentiles, as well as the Jews. And yet they still put tight, tight, tight boundaries on it. Um, you know, and within Catholicism, you know, unless you're baptized um, through the sacraments, you will never go to heaven. You will always be in hell. And of course, um, this helps us broaden that window and realize that the Lord has something else in mind. It's so comforting to realize every time we think we're in a place where we're beyond the reach of the Lord, we can go back to places like Alma 26, 37. Every land, anywhere we are, he is mindful of us. God is powerful to the fulfilling of all his words. Alma 37, Mormon 9. God is the same yesterday, today, forever. In him, there is no variableness. See, these are very consistent with the biblical tradition. All things, okay, this is also in the Bible, but I didn't find it today. All things which are good cometh of God. And that which is evil cometh of the devil. So let's celebrate all that is good and pray for inspiration in all subjects because we know that God is trying to bless us far beyond a theological sphere of our studies. But when we go into the nature of humanity, this is where I see so much difference in the scriptural text. Now, of course, Joseph is, is revealing these things as a prophet of God. And for us, it's clarifying, but it's consistent with the biblical language. Whereas when we talk about the nature of humanity, it's totally different than the thought thinking of the day. And it's different than the biblical language. So I find this is where we really um, have some diversity. Um, hey, Lynn. Oh, yes, please. Sorry, this is uh, Mike Cassidy. I just had a quick question before you move on to the nature of man with oh, the yeah, nature of God. Um, in Mosiah 15, this is where Abinadi is uh, preaching. Oh, good, 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 good. Okay, yes. Yeah, so in verse You read it for us? Yeah. Yeah, so it says, um, speaking of 
uh, he's trying to explain, uh, I guess, the relationship between uh, God and Jesus Christ. And he says, and because he dwells in the flesh, he shall be called the son of God. And having subjected the flesh to the will of the father, being the father and the son. Um, so that all makes sense to me. When, when I get to verse three, this is my question. Yeah. The father, because he was conceived by the power of God and the son because of the flesh, thus becoming the father and the son. So the part that I, I try to, and I'm trying to reconcile in my mind is, if I was describing someone conceived by someone else, I would think of them as the son, right? But it says the father because he was conceived by the power of God. Uh, that's the part I'm trying to uh, yeah. better understand. Yeah, yeah. And I think part of that is the vocabulary of the translator. We're dealing with a very um, limited vocabulary in the Book of Mormon. And every word has to be Joseph's vocabulary. So instead of saying origin or, or creator or organized, he uses the word conceive. Um, but I still see it in the same sense of he is our spiritual father because we cannot be born again without our Savior's atoning sacrifice. Tell me more about your thoughts on it, and and um, I'd love to oh, have I, everybody um, else open up and, and share their thoughts on this too. Go yeah, right ahead. I'm not, I'm not sure. Like I, I agree with you. I, I think I understand um, how he's the, our father, how Christ is our father. Yeah. Um, you know, the father of our new life. Um, it's just that I was. It's just the phraseology. I've always wondered, like how how that would be explained. Um, that, that he's the father because he was conceived by the power of God. And tell us the verse again so everybody else can look it up real quick to add That's their two cents. Mosiah 15, verse 3. Great, great. Yeah, I think it is the, um, the challenge of the word conceive that we in the 21st century take very literally meaning to procreate. Um, and I don't think that that's what was intended. Okay. Anybody else have thoughts there? Just because it's Joseph's vocabulary that is our stumbling block. Um, any Anybody else have thoughts here? One thought I had is that because maybe if because he was conceived by the father that gave him the ability to be part, you know, like God and to become the father of us. I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, that's great. I, I love that. And and very clearly he is. And then go down to verse seven too. Oh, excuse me, verse five. Um, we are willing to enter into a covenant with our God. Mosiah five. So it's Mosiah five, five, not Mosiah 15, five. And he says in verse five, um, we are willing to enter into a covenant and then go down to verse seven that we may be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For you say that your hearts are changed. Da, da, da. So the begotten is certainly consistent with the conceive. And yet for some reason here, it seems a little bit easier to understand, doesn't it? We are born of him. We have become his sons and daughters. Mosiah 5, 7. But begotten is the same word as conceive. You know, I don't know. You can check your OED. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Anybody else have any thoughts on that one? It's a good question. And King Benjamin um, is, is hard as well as Mosiah 15. <laughs> I pasted a link in the chat for anyone who wants to uh, download it. For oh, great. On great. The, uh, the first presidency uh, about 100 years ago made a... Uh, put out an official or semi-official statement on this uh, topic about how the sun becomes great. Popular. Wonderful, Gabriel. Thanks for having that ready for us. That's awesome. You're terrific. Uh, just talk. One, another thing that I've heard expressed is that um, essentially talking about two sides of the savior, the, the mortal side of the savior and the godly side of the savior who, who is the, are the atoning one. Yes, that's beautiful, Jen. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's just great. And I'm so glad you brought it up. Thank you. On the nature of man, 
or humanity. Um, unfortunately, it's because of the misunderstanding of the fall. And that's why I wanted to start um, our, our class this semester with the fall, because that misunderstanding really affects the way they see our relationship, not only with God, but with each other. The doctrine of original sin is, so to speak, the reverse side of the good news that Jesus is the savior of all men, that all need salvation. We cannot tamper with the revelation of original sin without undermining the mystery of Christ. So that, that ideology in Catholicism of original sin, we are all evil and wicked and damned is really tragic. And the Protestants don't leave it too far behind either. The creation of man was decreed by God in order to show his glory. In order for God's glory to be exhibited through his loving and merciful plan of salvation, man had to fall in order to be in need of salvation. So we have to have the brunt of God's glory, not he is going to help us to become glorified with him. But no, we have to have a, a sinful, wicked, awful, miserable state in order for him to show this. Therefore, according to the will of God, man sinned. Now, isn't that tragic? I do not believe that. Therefore, according to the will of God, man sinned. From that moment, the image of God in man was marred. And man became his own moral authority, unwilling to accept the laws of God. Man became unable to do anything on his own that would please God. Man retained a free will, but now that will is only able to sin. What a difference started in um, the restoration and grew and continues to grow as we um, are able to go to the temple. Second Nephi 2, men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil. And please remember these things are written in the 19th century when men could be humanity 90% of the time. Um, Second Nephi 2, this is um, Lehi speaking to his sons. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto men. They are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. You know, this is earth-shaking difference for Joseph Smith. I mean, as, as he and Oliver are translating they are learning enormous theological differences that have been um, removed from the discussions of Christian thought for thousands of years. Second Nephi 26, hath the Lord commanded any they should not partake of his goodness? Behold, I say unto you, nay, but all men are privileged, the one like unto the other, and none are forbidden. For the natural man is the enemy to God and has been from the time of Adam and will be forever unless he yields to the enticing of the Holy Spirit and puts off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child does submit to his father. And I have to just laugh because I have been a parent. Since when do child's children submit happily? <laughs> to their parents. I thought, okay, maybe they raised them differently, or maybe I just had some that um, had a little stronger wills. But uh, Mosiah 3, King Benjamin's servant, is beautiful in this description of, of, no, the reason why we sin is because there's a side of our nature that's tempting. And, and the natural man, and I use the word passions in our physical way here, we have to learn how to control our bodies. And our bodies are filled with passions that we need to learn to control our tongues and our hearts and our hands and um, our, our hormones. 
And we get these bodies, but the natural man has to learn how to control them and to submit them to the will of our Heavenly Father's commandments. Mormon chapter 9, verse 13, because of the redemption of man, which came by Jesus Christ, they are brought back into the presence of the Lord. Yea, this is wherein all men are redeemed because of the death of Christ. And it bringeth to pass the resurrection, which bringeth to pass a redemption from an endless sleep. I don't know if you saw this painting, but he's carrying the, the elements, the, the tools of the crucifixion. Can you see the nail in one hand? Isn't that a powerful image there? Um, and then, of course, Moroni chapter 8, all little children are alive in Christ and also all they that are without the law. So those that do not know right from wrong and those that have not been taught. For the power of the redemption cometh on them all. And this whole area, you know, for 10 verses here or so, it's just beautiful saying, no, if you haven't been taught, my atonement will cover you. I, I got your back. The majority of the world has not been taught. I'm going to take care of you. And then back to this marvelous section of, of the best philosophy we have in our, in our um, faith tradition. Man was also in the beginning with God, intelligence or the light and truth, and was not created or made, neither indeed can be. And that's where we come up to the translation of the book of Abraham. The Lord said unto me, meaning Abraham, these two facts do exist, that there are two spirits, one being more intelligent than the other, and there shall be another more intelligent than they all. And I am the Lord thy God, and I am more intelligent than they all. And there stood one among them who was like unto God, and he said unto those who were with him, we will go down, for there is space there. And we will take of these materials and we will make an earth whereupon these may dwell. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all the things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. And they who keep their first estate shall be added upon. And they who keep not their first estate shall not have glory in the same kingdom as those who kept their first estate. And they who keep their second estate shall have glory added upon their heads forever and ever. Lynn. Yes, Rich. Could you go back one slide to DNC 93? Yes. I, I think it, it bears repeating again and again that this is, this is one of the most crucial aspects of our understanding and the restoration of the, the relationship between God and mankind. Uh, we are not some finite creation made by God from nothing at all and totally, completely, eternally separate from him, that we are in fact, um, we are co-eternal. Our, our core intelligence or being is co-eternal with that of God that that throws aside huge pieces of of worldly theology and it, you know it's it uh it resolves issues such as how can there be evil when god is totally good well god did not totally create out of nothing everybody and everything and so there is there are intelligences that are sinful and evil and uh he can't he can't simply change them or else he would cease to be god by taking away their agency and it goes on and on there are this is one of the most <coughs> excuse me <coughs> One, this is really foundational to our understanding and why, why in so many ways we understand things so much more clearly and so completely differently. Well, and Rich, I'm really glad you had us go back because I, I didn't explain that this is not 
the current definition of intelligence. Section 93 and Abraham 4 uses this vocabulary word in a new way. And maybe there is some overlap between the way we refer to an IQ, how, how readily someone will be to absorb information. But the idea that there is a, a seed that is light and truth that can become a spirit, which can become a body, is just fascinating. And that's where God's vision to Abraham shed so much light and information. Thank you, Rich, for that pause. It, it bears, you know, as you're falling asleep tonight, just ponder on that. It is just beautiful and absolutely earth shattering. It, no one was teaching this. Joseph's view um, that he was able to restore is absolutely unique in this regard. The Lord, um, obviously, what would Satan try to destroy first? His understanding of God and then the understanding of family and our relationships together and our relationships with God. So thank you so much, Rich. Anybody else before I go on to the King Follett's discourse? Okay. Uh, several years ago, oh, here's one more. Abraham chapter four, the gods organized and formed the heavens and earth. Joseph's really big on this organized. He doesn't like create. Um, uh, he likes organized because create sounds too much in his mind like creation ex nihilo in English. So he really preferred using organized in his, in his sermons. And as a couple of years ago in Institute, we read all the sermons that, um, well, we didn't read all of them. We read the majority of Joseph's sermons um, in Nauvoo for one summer. And I was amazed how the King Follett discourse no longer seemed new, no longer seemed to have information that was unique to itself. It, it's, it's all over his Nauvoo sermons. And I also am convinced that it is all over his revelations. And um, as you know, look at the date right there. It's a couple months before he is martyred. Um, April 7th, they're having their general conference. And one of his dear, dear close friends who even had come into his home uh, and lived for a period, a King Follett had passed away. And um, Joseph chose for one of his conference reports of this um, April 7th, to use the topic of the death of King Follett and give a funeral sermon as the conference report. And I have only a small portion here, a larger portion on my handout, but I have the best site. I'm so excited about this site because as you know, Joseph gave all of his um, sermons extemporaneously. And so the scribes are just writing down as fast as they can. And we have five different scribes, I believe, who are recording the King Follett's discourse. But of these five, none of them overlap. And so since it was such a powerful sermon, the scribes got together and, and chose, okay, he said this, he did this, and they came up with some sort of a conglomerate of, of the talk. And um, then someone else, um, decades later, rewrote it again and it wasn't until um, 1975 that someone said, let's go back and do our own editing <laughs> and make sure we're not repeating things and we are not adding things. It has to be in the scribal notes. And that is Steve Larson and that's the footnote I have for you there. Um, it's a BYU Studies article and it's an excellent resource. Also, of course, um, E. Hatton Cook are the editors who have the book, Joseph Smith's Sermons, that's available. Um, actually, I think it's called Words of Joseph Smith, his sermons in Nauvoo, Words, W-R-I-D-S, of Joseph Smith. But I think I have both of those in our handout. Question? Yes. <clears throat> I'm just wondering what the father saw in us to make us part of his family to gather us out as intelligences and include us in his family as spirit children, and then potential habitants on the earth to become glorified one day. What did he see in us? What did he see in the simple people and as well as the intelligent people that caused him to want to move that in that direction and make us part of his family? What do you think? 
I don't I know. I think it's an excellent question. You, you, you've you thought about it. What do you think? Because I don't think simple, I, intelligence doesn't mean IQ. Intelligence means light. And sometimes the most simple people have the most light. Light and truth is what intelligence means. Lynn? Yeah. Hi, this is Susan. I missed you. I. Hi, Susan. Do you want to give I... a thought on this one? Yeah. Um... I hope that I followed the question appropriately, but you know, we are procreated even spiritually. So we weren't uh, some spirit form entity that was chosen. We actually were birthed spiritually from a heavenly father and heavenly mother. So as you said, Lynn, just like the world wasn't created from uh <clears throat> non-existent material it was created from material that just got organized into an earth and so i guess my understanding of intelligence is that there's some kind of spiritual matter from which you know they are organized into humanity it, into our spirit, yeah. into our spirit. But, no, but 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 yeah. the same nature of procreation reproductive mm -hmm. uh humans uh, are in the spirit world as well in other words the the spirit body we have was literally procreated in the same manner that mortal life is procreated that's the best we can understand it right now and when we get there and we learn more we'll be thrilled <laughs> you know, so I we're his like we're we his got our toe in the bathtub and <laughs> that's what the lord's revealed to us i think it's an excellent question john but I still feel like, oh no, the simple ones are probably the ones with the greatest light and truth. And yet, remember Paul's description of the body Christ, everybody has a place and a part. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question and it's a great thought, Susan. Thank you very, very much. Can I add one thing, Lynn? This is my yeah, question. Please, hi. Um, I just think of the scripture that says, uh, for God first loved us or that that uh, scripture that yes. it's the love of god he loves all of his children so much you know even the ones who are wicked or choose not to follow him mm -hmm. his love is so great um you know as it says god is love that I and mean, that's what that's why he wants us as part of his family is because he's so full of love and i think that's that's oh, kind of what that i thought is, of the first question that is a perfect answer i'm so glad you jumped in Yes, of course. He has so much charity emanating from him that, and that's his whole, um, according to section one, that's his whole work and is to, to provide and um, to love others and to allow others to um, affiliate and learn from him. Yeah, that's just perfect. Thanks. Well, I've sort of run out of time, so we won't be able to go over much of the King um, Follett's discourse tonight, but that's okay. It is a beautiful thought, and I think Susan did a nice bridge over there. Um, the, the bottom line that he taught is that um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, when it says we are created in the image of God, is absolutely real. The King Follett's Discourse is a second witness to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So we end where we began, and we can um, be grateful, more so than ever before, um, that we have the understanding we do of the nature of humanity and our relationship to our God, our relationship to our Savior, our need for a Redeemer, our need not only to be born again, but to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost in order to serve him and to um, overcome the trials of this earth life. The thorns and the thistles and the pains can all be moderated when we um, follow Christ's teachings, when we develop that charity and hope and trust in our Savior. And I am one who has develop trust in my Lord. And I know that no matter what happens, if we can reach out to him, he will be there for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Yeah.
Kate Foster, I'm so happy that you'll be able to hear your voice in a minute. Can you offer our closing prayer? Absolutely. Thanks, Kate.